Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and today we'll be exploring Cyberpunk Red. Published in 2020 by Artel Sorian Games, Cyberpunk is the newest edition of the Cyberpunk role-playing game. Cyberpunk has been a very special game for me for decades now. Cyberpunk 2020 was the first RPG that I really got into after D&D. In fact, for several years, it was our primary RPG that we played. The very first review that I did for this channel was for Cyberpunk, which was a terribly crude video, so I redid it later on with a less terrible video. I also reviewed the Cyberpunk Red Jumpstart kit back when that released. Artel Sorian even gave my channel a little nod, referencing my Scott Brown incident video on page 26 of the core book, which I can never ever express my squeals of joy at seeing that. So when the full Cyberpunk Red core book released, my longtime fans were obviously curious about my thoughts on it, which I've remained pretty silent on. The reason for that being is first, I don't want to review a game unless I feel that I've played enough of it to feel that I've got a really good understanding of the game, and at the time we were busy playing other campaigns. And second, as a veteran of the old edition with hundreds of hours of playtime, I needed to separate myself from the old edition of Cyberpunk to really judge Cyberpunk Red off of itself, and not through the eyes of some old grognard who's now focused on how it's not just like the previous edition was. So I have been able to separate myself from most most of my comparisons of Red to the old edition, it can now give what I hope is a fair and honest review of Red based off of its own merits. The task of updating the edition for a modern audience was huge, and Artel Sorian Games did a great job streamlining it, making it feel far smoother than it was before. However, I also feel that that pendulum swing might have just gone just a little bit too far in some areas. So long intros out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about Cyberpunk Red. First, the core book is a massive 455 pages. It is everything that you need to play, and it is packed with beautiful art. It looks fantastic. My only complaint is that I deeply wish we had more pictures of certain in-game things, like pieces of equipment or tech or fashion. I would have been happier with just black and white images if that meant that we got to have more images and get to see what specific weapons and specific armor might look like. One thing I do appreciate is the PDF of the book is packed with hyperlinks, so you can quickly navigate around. Around. Unfortunately, the physical book is a lot harder to navigate, especially with certain charts that are almost repeats of each other but in different sections of the book, and it feels more designed to be used as a PDF than be used as a physical book, and I feel that while they did a really good job of getting into that red motif, just about everything in here is red, it could have really benefited from having some color coding of the different sections to help with navigating it around and trying to flip through the book. What is Cyberpunk Red? Well, Cyberpunk Red is a game about the dark future, set in the year 20. 2045 between the time of Cyberpunk 2020 and 2077 from the video game and the Edge Runner show. It's a game where characters might be living the high life one week and barely scraping by the next. Unlike the time of 2020, the megacorps of old have lost most of their power, supply chains are shot, and goods are harder to find, and the gulf between the haves and the have-nots is now wider than ever. The neon and chrome of the 2020s is far more rust and decay now. Essentially, Cyberpunk Red puts a lot of emphasis on the word punk. Characters, who are also referred to as edge runners, can have various roles or professions. Medic, media, tech, fixer, lawman, solo, and the like. There's ten roles in total. Each one has a single special ability defined by that role. And their skill level in that ability can raise. But Cyberpunk, it's not a class or a level-based game like you'd find with Dungeons & Dragons. It's a skill-based game, meaning that a character's proficiency in each skill, be it driving a car, or shooting a gun, or picking a lock, or bribing a guard, that is separate from their role and improves improves individually, and any role can use any skill in the game. Cyberpunk is also a very deadly game. Your hit points aren't going to be improving as you play, so you ain't going to be able to shrug off no bullets or nothing like that because you're a seventh level fixer and you got more hit points now. Nah, you probably ain't got no more hit points than that second level fixer does down the street. A bullet or a blade is always going to pose a deadly threat. So characters are going to need to improve their armor and their tactics and their skills and can upgrade far beyond human capabilities with cyberware enhancements, though at the cost of their humanity and their sanity. It is a gritty game that's focused on style and character personality. It's not about your character necessarily living a long life, but it's more about being remembered for what life you did live. What do I need to play Cyberpunk? Well, outside the core book, all you need is some D10s, preferably two of those, and some D6. I'd recommend that you have at least four D6 but preferably you should have five. And while a grid battle mat isn't necessary because of the weapon ranges and how combat's used, players might find it a lot more handy if they've got a grid for it. 
Character creation is by far the largest section of the book, taking just over 90 pages. Reason for that is it offers us several different ways to create a character. There's a street rat method, which is super fast, offering you templates for your stats and what skills you have, at what level, what equipment you have, and you are done. This is great for making characters as quickly as possible and then getting them into the game. Then there's the edge runner method, which is a bit more customizable with some point buying of skills. It's a little bit slower, but I prefer it over the street rat method. Then there's the complete package, which is a straight up point buy, letting your players assign stats and skill points and buy all their gear one piece at a time. Players can do it however they want, though I like that they can at least review what the gear and everything was from the two previous methods to kind of gauge what equipment and stats they might want for this type of character. Now this one is the most time consuming and it's much more suited for your veteran players who have a good idea of what to expect and what to prepare for. My only complaint with it is because the three methods of character creation take up so much portions of the book, I'd have liked to have had some color coding or some other means to kind of quickly differentiate everything. My only complaint with it is that the second method was called the edge runner. Nah, the complete package, that's the one that should have been called the edge runner. And the second method, that could have been called something like the punk or something like that. Edge runners should be elite not mid-grade. But one of my favorite parts of character creation is the life path. Cyberpunk is a great life path system. We can roll or choose your character's background, where they grew up, how many siblings they have, friends and enemies they've made, tragic love affairs, and family crises. It rounds out a character in a very fun way. Additionally, each profession has their own life path that's specifically tailored for that role, such as a med tech one determines what kind of flesh mechanic you are, if they have a partner, if so, who that is, what their workspace is, who their primary clients are, and how they get their supplies. It is great. The life path system in this game is fantastic. In a few short minutes, we can go from a character being just a bunch of numbers on a sheet to having a history and personality, friends and enemies, and connections. The game mechanics are pretty simple. We begin with our 10 stats, each of those ranging between 2 and 8. Each stat is related to a skill, which can be ranked anywhere from 0 to 10. Making a skill roll, such as in athletics, is simply adding your skills level, we'll say 4, plus the appropriate stat. That. In this case, to note it as dex, so you can see that next to athletics, we'll say our dex is 7. Adding those up gives us a base of 11. So we add a d10. If a die comes up with a result of a 10, it explodes, meaning that you get to roll again and add both of those together. We then apply any situational modifiers, some minuses, other positives like good equipment or taking our time, and we total up the results. Compare that total to the target difficulty value, 13 to 15 being your standard DVs, and if you make that number higher, you succeed. If the player rolls a 1 on their skill test, then they suffer a critical failure. So we add up the total stat plus skill plus that 1 that they rolled, then roll another d10 and subtract it from that total. In some cases, if the difficulty was low enough, they might still succeed at that. Personally, I feel in those instances we should still have some sort of cost, such as they succeed, but maybe they emptied out their gun's magazine, or they succeeded in picking the lock but they destroyed the lock or maybe their picks in the process. Some sort of cost that says even if they did manage to succeed, there was still some sort of failure involved. This is still way better than how the previous editions handled fumbles. I mean, Cyberpunk 2020 was rife with them. You know, check out a what story videos for what bug and our first total party kill if you want to see how many fumbles we used to have to deal with in those. You know, while you're at it, go ahead and check out the Scott Brown incident video because now that they mention it in the cool book, I think that means that's a canon story now. Our Tell Story and Games just recently tweeted how Scott Brown agents would be fixes. In the case of opposed skill rolls, like a character's stealth versus a guard's perception skill, each party rolls their appropriate skill check and the highest one succeeds, ties going to the defender. Improving or learning a new skill is done through improvement points, or IP, and at the end of each session, a game master awards the players a certain number of improvement points based off how well they did as a group, or based off their individual play styles, so maybe 50 to 60 IP are awarded on average per session. These are then spent on skills, and the number of IP it costs to buy a skill depends on the level and the type of skill it is. So a regular skill, if you wanted to go from 4th to 5th, would cost you 100 IP, meaning that it might take you two or more sessions to gain enough FIP to raise that skill one level. Or if you chose to improve your role special ability, going from 4th to 5th is 300 IP, which that is, that is a lot. Now personally, I feel that IP awards should be for both the group and also the personal play style, potentially doubling the number of IP that are awarded, 
Also, I wish that IP could be awarded to specific skills rather than to just a big broad general pool. Like if a player does something just really badass or really clever with a particular skill, like you know, driving a motorcycle or something, I'd like to award them some bonus IP, but only for that particular skill. Oh yeah, back in the old edition, we'd even house ruled that if a player did something absolutely amazing with this skill, the Game Master would give him IP for that specific skill because they had done something pretty impressive with it. Same thing happened if a character fumbled on a skill roll, Game Master would give him one IP for every single time that they fumbled because they had just learned a valuable lesson of what not to do. Now one IP every time you fumble, that might not sound like much. But given the amount that we fumbled in the game, that added up pretty quickly. Now this is all in addition to the general IP pool that the book suggests. Another thing that I wish the game offered us is a bonus and penalty dice mechanic, where a player might roll 2d10 and then use the best one of those, or uh, 2d10 and then use the worst one of those if we've got a penalty die going on, which has become really popular with a lot of modern games and feels kind of weird that we didn't find it in the new Cyberpunk, but we've gone ahead and we've house ruled that into our table. Now, another criticism that I have, and this isn't about the rules themselves, but more of the layout of the rules, the character sheet lays the skills out in groups, your awareness skills, fighting skills, social skills, etc. And then not my preferred way, but I can handle and deal with that. My complaint is, if you want to look up the skill descriptions in the book, they're also laid out the same way, where you first have to find the category, awareness, body control, education, whatever, and then the skills are alphabetical under each of those categories. This leads to a lot of page flipping and searching around trying to find the category of the skill and then find the skill itself, and I'd have much preferred to have all the skill descriptions inside the book just be one big alphabetical list. Now, Netrunning in Cyberpunk Red is awesome. The old edition Netrunning was just about unplayable. Netrunning in the time of Red is fast and easy and extremely lethal, as enemy hackers and black ice programs try to fry the character's brain. Because the net in the game world is entirely different than the internet of the present day or in the internet of the old edition, it takes a bit to wrap your head around these tiny nets versus a big giant worldwide internet. So instead of staying home where it's safe, Netrunner characters have to go out and get physically close to the target in order to hack it, meaning that they're going to have to go out and join the rest of the party on their adventures. However, Netrunners are kind of like your wizards that you'd have in a standard fantasy game. So Game Masters, if any of your players are going to want to play a Netrunner, you have got to learn the rules and everything about it in order to prepare. And players, if you are wanting to play a Netrunner, you have got to learn how Netrunning works as well as what all your programs and all your equipment does, otherwise your brain is going to get fried. Every group out there has got that one player who just refuses to learn the rules of what all their gear and equipment and abilities are. Those players might want to avoid playing a Netrunner, unless of course they like making up new characters. Cyberware is a huge part of the game, and we get a pretty great list of cybernetic enhancements that your characters can get. New limbs, new eyes, ports in their head, bulletproof skin, there is quite a bit here. Now, most cyber cost humanity, which is your empathy stat multiplied by 10. So if you have a 6 empathy, you have a 60 humanity. As your humanity drops due to cyber, so does your empathy stat and any skill checks that are related to it. If your humanity reaches zero, your character disassociates from reality and becomes cyber psycho, and often max stat gets to take them out. Now one issue that I have with the pre-filled out character templates and the packages is it lists starting cyber complete with the starting humanity loss for each package, such as the solo cyberware package costs 14 humanity, lowering your empathy by one. However, that's not entirely correct there. If your starting humanity is 60 and you lose 14 off that, that now gives you a 46 humanity, which means your empathy is dropped by two, not one. According to the book's own example, empathy is rounded down, so a character reducing the humanity from 44 down to 39 now is a 3 empathy, so just one point below 40 dropped it to a 3, which means for the starting character package, which that template was made for, the empathy loss that's denoted there is wrong. A big criticism that I have about the book is repetition. For example, in the section that's titled Putting the Cyber into the Punk, we get cyberware descriptions in these charts. However, they aren't complete. 250 pages later, in the section titled The New Street Economy, it gives these tables again, but with more information, and some of that really would have been useful in the first tables. This causes a lot of needless confusion, because when a player wants to look up the cyber that they got for their character, they're of course going to go to the chapter that is specifically named for having cyber in it. But little do they know, on the opposite end of the book, in a chapter about freaking economics of all things, that is where the real information is. So now we 
have two nearly identical shots that are in this book separated by 200 freaking pages when we could have just had a single shot that had all the information we needed and zero confusion. And that is part of the reason why this rule book is needlessly huge. Another nit that I have is on the character sheet that's dedicated to cyberware. It has a ton of wasted space, allotting only a tiny portion to the data notes about what a particular piece of cyber does. I really dig the way it lays out the locations for each section on the body and shows how many slots can be fit in there, but I don't like how they don't quite give us enough room for data descriptions to make usable notes outside of simply noting which page number you can find the cyberware description at. Now let's talk about combat. Combat is the section that makes or breaks most RPGs. Cyberpunk Red has made a lot of improvements, cleaning and speeding up the old Cyberpunk 2020 mechanics. However, this is one of those areas where I feel they might have swung the pendulum just a little bit too hard, and I've got a few complaints about it. The basics for it are simple. Characters make a skill test. For melee, the attacker makes an opposed fighting versus their opponent's evasion. For ranged weapons, the attacker makes their weapon skill test versus the range of the shot. Or, for some opponents who might have extremely high reflexes, remember, 8 was the maximum skill we could start off at, they make an opposed roll against the target's evasion, which I guess range no longer factors in on those sort of cases for any discernible reason at all. I mean, I think that the target with the high reflex, you know, if they can evade the shot, providing the two hit roll was also good enough to even hit the target at that range. Range difficulty values depend on the weapon that's being fired. So a semi-auto shot from a pistol at 0 to 6 meters is difficulty 13, while 13 to 25 meters is difficulty 20. For automatic fire, we use this other chart, which shows the same difficulty values for SMGs and assault rifles, though with an overall reduced range for those, which seems a little bit weird that hitting with an automatic rifle at 100 meters is a pretty basic 15 difficulty, but just beyond that is impossible, like the bullets just stop cold in the air or something like that. And I feel that they should have allowed for longer auto fire shots, but with a sharply increase in difficulty, like it goes from 15 to 25 once it hits 100 meters, but you you know, the bullet is still going, so maybe you could hit with that. Damage is determined by the weapon type, such as a medium pistol does 2d6, heavy pistol does 3d6, and assault rifle does 5d6. Once totaled, the damage is reduced by the target's armor. The armor didn't stop all the damage, its stopping power is then reduced by 1 against any future attacks, and the remaining damage is then applied against the target's hit points. A wounded character suffers no problems until they're reduced below half hit points and they enter the seriously wounded category, at which point they suffer a minus 2 to all actions. And when they run out of hit points, they're mortally wounded, and they suffer all sorts of serious minuses to their actions, and they have to make a death save, which is their body stat on a D10, every single round. If you roll under your body, they survive that combat round. But and death saves start getting more difficult by one each and every round, meaning that the chance for failure goes up. If they fail a single death save, the character dies, and then can be sold off for spare parts. This is way smoother than it was in the previous edition. We had to do a stun save every single time we took damage. And then we also had to roll the damage location and calculate the individual armor for each individual part of our body. Two legs, two arms, a torso, and a head. Now, of course, we only got two damage locations now. We got the whole body, which is everything below the neck, and then we got the head. Now, headshots, those things are bad news. You do not want to get hit in the head. But you can't hit somebody in the head unless you do a call shot, and that is a minus eight to do. That is seriously difficult to do. Now, of course, armor in your head, that is a good idea, because, you know, I keep a lot of valuable stuff up in mind. But if you're going to be walking around town and trying to look cool and improve your rep and going to clubs trying to be seen, showing off your cool hair, you are going to look really lame walking in there wearing a freaking helmet. And that should be mocked by every NPC they meet. Now, when you're rolling your damage dice, if two of those d6 that you're rolling for damage come up with a 6, then a critical hit has been achieved. Critical hits are devastating. In addition to doing five more additional points of damage, we get to roll on this chart, meaning that we might have lost a limb, collapsed a lung, or suffered a spinal injury. If a headshot gets a critical hit, then there is another table with even worse critical injuries on it, like losing an eye or brain damage. So, the more d6 that a weapon does in damage, the higher chance you have of two or more 
more of those rolling sixes and causing a critical injury to ruin someone's day. I love this critical hit mechanic, though I do have one complaint with it, and that's that critical hit is only determined by the damage dice that are rolled and not by the two hit roll itself. So if a character rolls two hit and they get an extreme success where they then roll an additional d10 and they end up with some insanely good two hit roll, like a 28 or something, they then just still roll normal damage just like it was a normal shot. And you know, so they don't have any better chance of having gotten a critical hit with that really good two hit roll, even though their attack roll was amazing. And that can be extremely disappointing to a player when that happens. So a suggestion here is for every six points that a player maybe exceeded their two hit roll by, that lets them re-roll 1d6 of that weapon's damage and take the battle one. So if you need to get a 15 to hit a bad guy and you got a 21, congratulations. You get to re-roll one of those d6 and maybe one of them's going to be a six now for one before. That means that the player is not going to be doing more damage than they would have before, at least what that weapon was capable of doing, but the chances of getting a crit with that weapon are much, much better. However, as much as they have streamlined combat, I have several issues with this. First is cover. Cover only counts if the character is 100% behind something that can stop a bullet, like a wall or a car body, in which case damage is then applied to the cover and not to the character. However, there's no partial cover. It's either all in or all out. And if you stick your head or your legs out, your cover no longer counts at all, which is silly. Reason being is that we have rules for called shots already in the game. If a character sticks their head out from behind cover to squeeze off a couple rounds, they should still be covered. The main part of their body, their center mass, is still protected, but their head and their hands should be open to a called shot. Shields can provide cover too, and that is great. But unless we're talking about a full body tower shield, the legs should still be open to call shots unless the target is specifically squatting behind that shield. I find the cover rules of either being 100% in or 100% out infuriating. Because the game has already provided us with rules for aimed body location shots, they just simply needed to take those two things and put them together. We also get rules for human shields, which are a lot like regular shields but squirming around and begging for their lives. Now with those, you can do a called headshot to get somebody that's got a human shield. However, we feel that the human shield, you should also be able to do a cult shot against the person's legs. Remember in the movie Robocop and that dude is holding that woman hostage and he's saying how he ain't gonna get his so Robocop shot that guy in the dick? Yeah, this game is trying to emulate that feeling of being like in Robocop, but it's not allowing for Robocop style dick shots. Other criticisms include, but are not limited to, drawing a weapon incurs no penalty or benefit to do that in advance. So if one character has their gun out and readied, another can draw and fire just as effectively, even faster than they can have their round in combat. While drawing a weapon shouldn't be an entire combat action or entire move action, I feel that drawing and using it in the same initiative should either hinder their initiative or their ability to hit something that first round, versus somebody who already has their weapon out and readied. That encourages characters to draw their weapons when they're expecting trouble versus only drawing their weapon once they're already in trouble. While being prone, a character cannot move until they get up. There's no half movement or anything like that for crawling. Also, prone characters are just as easy to hit as standing ones are, so things like hitting the deck or trying to crouch and run while somebody's firing at you, that serves no purpose at all in this game. Also, prone characters get no benefit for lying down to fire a weapon, like a sniper that's lying down to take a good shot. Outside of making called shots for body locations, characters get no bonuses for aiming, such as for going your move action in order to aim for the round and increasing your chance to hit. There's also no modifiers for firing while running, or firing from a moving vehicle, or trying to hit a fast moving target, which means nothing encourages your players to run and move and keep from being hit, or maybe just stand still in the middle of the combat, increasing your own chances of getting hit, but in order to aim to make some sort of really important shot that they gotta do. Weapon fire is either single shot or full auto using 10 bullets at a time. There is no three round burst, something that was included in the jump starts kit that I previously reviewed but is now absent from the full rules, which is hardly the only rules difference that I found between the jump start and the full rules set. There are quite a bit of these, but I wish that burst fire was still available in the game. So you could have something like a machine pistol that maybe holds 12 rounds. So you could fire, you know, four three round bursts with that, or maybe go full auto and use 10 rounds of that leaving it with you know, two shots that you can use later on, or you know, whatever combination it is the player wants. Yeah, it's a moot point anyway now that they ain't got machine pistols no more outside of your basic SMGs. True, be awesome if they did. Also, if we could have some sort of rules where maybe a techie could modify a regular pistol in order for it to now have a three round burst. 
Now, speaking of modifications, let's look at weapon modifications. We get several that we can install, which is pretty cool that they have those, though two things are noticeably absent from this list. Lasers, like regular old laser sights, those do not exist in the game, despite this picture of this woman having one right here, which I think it'd be cool if we had them in the game. Maybe you could give a plus one to hit or some other modifier like that, but, you know, at the penalty, they can see where that laser is coming from. There's also no silencers that I've been able to find. They evidently aren't a thing in Cyberpunk Red. Whoa, 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 no silences? Those are a staple of Cyberpunk, and now they ain't got them? Why the hell not? I don't know. The only mention I found of them in the rule book is in the Never Fade Away short story, but that takes place in 2013. Evidently, by the time of Red in 2045, humanity has lost suppressor technology, I guess. Also with weapons, the book is very generic with them. Pistols, for example, we have three types. Medium, heavy, and very heavy pistols, with these prices listed. Now, hiding further back in the book, on page 342, it mentions that these are only the standard quality pistols, and we get other quality pistols, low or high high quality and what that means and how that affects the price. So instead of spending 50 euro bucks on a media pistol, I could spend 20 for a poor quality one, or spend 100 eddies for an excellent quality one. We also get some examples of weapon names for each uh, quality tier with each type of pistol. So a medium handgun, we have a Dai Lung Street Master, Federated Arms X9, or a Militech Avenger, depending on the weapon quality that we bought. Now while I tried to cut down on my direct comparisons between Red and the old edition, I'm going to need to here. In Cyberpunk 2020, the weapon chart presents multiple handguns for each category tier up front, and the players then have to weigh the balance of do I want the Militech Arms Avenger, it's very reliable for 250 EB, but it only holds 10 rounds. Or I could get the Dai Lung Street Master, which holds 12 rounds, does a little bit more damage and costs the same, but it's also less reliable. Or maybe a Federated Arms, which is standard reliability and holds 12 rounds at 300 bucks. Maybe the Budget Arms Auto 3. It does more damage, but it only holds 8 rounds, is unreliable, and has a minus 1 to hit. So players in that edition, they got to weigh all these factors, the concealability, damage, reliability, magazine capacity, price, and choose what weapon they wanted off of that. The whole time these brands and model numbers are getting ingrained inside the player's head. This weapon makes better weapons than that company does, and brand recognition naturally became a thing that players learned from the game, and was all incorporated through the whole process process. Cyberpunk Red, we really only have this uh, nameless standard quality pistols for each category, and the players, if they dig deep enough in the book, they can discover there are other qualities that they could buy, and if we want, we can also consult this other table somewhere else to learn what the name and the brand of that gun is. It's kind of like an afterthought that they threw in here, and it's all presented hundreds of pages after the standard weapons have already been introduced. This sounds like it's a minor nit, but you gotta understand that the separation of the brand names from the products inside the rulebook really did bum us out when we first read this. Because now the play is they gotta go out of their way just to learn the names of these companies and the names of these products, versus before it was all just incorporated to the simple act of making a character and getting to play the game. You know, the play is they couldn't help but learn these names and start learning a little bit about the companies, and that really did push the immersion without even having to try to. I mean, this, this is not a medium handgun. This is a freaking Militech. And Bobby, Bobby's got himself a Sternmeyer 35. And Tommy, yeah, Tommy's got himself a Dai Lung. And we all know that Dai Lung is freaking crap, am I right? And players understood what I just said right there because that is how you played the game. That is how you purchased your equipment. And those names were incorporated the entire way through. Whereas the Cyberpunk Red just feels generic. And that's ultimately how I feel about the combat rules. I love so much about how they've streamlined it and how it plays and how they've improved the rules, but that it just went on to strip away all the modifiers for firing while running or cover being all or none or that strategy that players can employ to give themselves an edge or overcome something at the expense of something else. That cinematic aspect of running and crouching, all of that's been lost in this new edition. For many years, the Cyberpunk 2020 combat system was my very favorite one, despite all of its many faults, and the reason for that was all the modifiers that encouraged active and cinematic play versus you know, just standing in the same place and firing your gun every round. You know, I could go on with my criticisms here. I do have more, such as shotguns having ridiculous range in the area of effect like a 1990s Duke Nukem game. Six by six meters? Seriously? I can't hit that dude four meters away, but these have just been the big ones for me. My enthusiasm to play this game, a game that I've been waiting years and years for, deflated when I 
read the combat rules, and it wasn't just me. You know, my longtime players, you know, have played with me for years. We did those war stories that I made videos about together. They couldn't wait to return to the mean streets of Night City. They felt it too after they read this. It's not that we didn't still want to play it. We did want to play it. We're playing the game right the hell now. But that burning desire to make it a top priority, that we got to drop whatever the hell campaign we're doing and get back to some cyberpunk right now, that seriously cooled. Finally, let's look at the economy. This is a really cool section. It does help establish the world of Cyberpunk Red, where instead of stores, we have these night markets where people might be selling goods out of shipping containers, and what can be found in the night market really just depends on what all's available that day. I love the way they set up these markets. It really reminds me of William Gibson's Virtual Light, which is probably my favorite of all his novels. We have rules for side hustles that our characters can do between adventures to make enough money to survive before the next adventure. All of this is fun. I love it. I love it so much. Our section about fashion and our characters getting into what styles it is that they like. You know, that should always be critical to a cyberpunk game. Style is a big part of it. I only wish we had pictures of what these specific fashions look like at the time are read, as well as brand names to go along with it. Now, hopefully that's something that will be in a future Chromebook supplement. Getting into all the clothing brand names and uh, Cyberpunk 2020, that was reserved for the Chromebooks that came out later on, so I don't fault this core book for not having in it. I'm just really looking forward to see what uh, this new Chromebook is going to have. Now, those praises being said, where it loses me is Cyberpunk Red follows a very weird pricing structure where items are listed as being cheap costly, expensive, or luxury to very specific price values, almost as if everything in the world is priced at these specific values. 10, 20, 50, 100, 500, etc. Looking at fashion or gear, cyber, goods and services, and everything else, the prices follow this very specific pattern. And if you want to step up from your 50 euro buck item, it's going to be 100 euro bucks. Step up from that is 500 and so on. Not 200, not 350 or 800. It's the same pattern as Monopoly money. Now, I've heard a rumor that this was intentionally modeled after Monopoly Money, which you know, I usually don't go for all the rumors that I hear, but I believe this one because they're all the same values and it just feels like that. It's very formulaic pricing and everything following this kind of rigid price structure absolutely yanks me out of the world. It makes it feel like I'm playing a cheesy board game instead of a gritty cyberpunk game. You know, it wouldn't have been too much to price things between different thresholds, such as this 40 euro item is still an everyday price, but you know, once it's 50 euros, it's going to cross that threshold into costly, and the availability is going to change because it's now in a different pricing tier. Once again, they made everything really easy here, because now a game master can just kind of look at these pricing tiers, and they can use that to determine what the availability is for certain products inside the world of red. And it is cool that they set it up that way, because game masters, they can do that without having to think too hard about it, and that is great. But then they kind of kept swinging that pendulum along just a little bit too far, and then it stopped being as cool. Because now instead of having these pricing tiers or anything between this price and this price, that's going to fall into this category. Now it's just one price per tier, then it jumps several hundred eddies off to the next tier with nothing at all in between them, and that is just goofy. Overall, even with my complaints, the book that needlessly repeats portions, making it bloated and confusing to navigate, the Monopoly money pricing, the overly stripped down combat system, Cyberpunk Red has a lot to offer. The special abilities for each of the roles are awesome. I didn't have time to go into that, but they are all fantastic. Neck running is sleek and great. I love it. The world itself of Red I absolutely adore. There is a lot to dig about this game, and I am so excited to finally see that Cyberpunk is getting wider recognition mission after all these years. However, on the whole, while Cyberpunk Red is a game that I like, it's not a game that I love. I also fully admit that I am a very biased player coming from the previous edition. Now, I've tried to take my time here to give this review, you know, kind of a, a good look at what the game is, and more of an honest assessment of this new edition versus the old edition that I'm very familiar with, but I am still only human. But after taking my time to play it and absorb it and talking with my friends after we've all tried it, and we've had a lot of fun, I find it good, but I don't find it great. And I deeply hope that all the new players coming in and they're lacking all that same baggage and knowing the old system and they're looking at it with fresh eyes, and they can see Cyberpunk Red for what it is. And I hope they love it. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews, RPG war stories, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, Chumbas, you have a great day. You know,
You should have mentioned that years after you wrecked his game in the What Bug incident, your buddy George is now running you through Cyberpunk Red. It has been great, and I haven't even called Bombshell once. Guess I'm cured. Yeah, wasn't it at Gen Con this year when Artel Saurian Games was running you through Cyberpunk Red that you would yell bootleg a turd every time you tried to do something crazy? So just because you weren't saying the word bombshell, don't mean you weren't saying bombshell. Totally different thing. Bombshell means that the plan has failed and violence is the only answer left to you. Bootlegger turd means that there's very little chance this insane stunt's gonna work, but it's gonna be legendary if I pull it off. And then you couldn't understand why George would give up game mastering for 10 freaking years after running you through one session. You are hopeless.